Thanks for staying with us. Now, in the past, most Nigerians always looked forward to meeting fellow Nigerians from other tribes because we truly loved each other enough to not only learn the, the next tribe's language, but also live and intermarry. We took care of each other and protected the person from a different tribe amongst us. Crime was crime, regardless of tribe. And relationships were built based on merit and a person. Now, any Nigerian could leave their state and boldly stay in another man's um, state because they felt comfortable in, amongst non-tribe people. Now, today, the music is completely different. As we are constantly advocating or practicing strong loyalty to one's own tribe or social group, regardless of their conduct. So how did we get to the point where we have become intolerant of ourselves to the extent where we kill, rape, rob, displace our fellow Nigerians and our number one citizen of our country, I mean, is perceived to be tribalistic? Watch this video. 1999, the election, the Yorubas who will probably, it depends on how you look at it, um, they will be either the second largest tribe in Nigeria or depending how, if you take Hausa for Fulani, you separate them, Hausa separate and Fulani separate, the Yorubas might even be the largest uh, uh, tribe in Nigeria. Um, <clears throat> they didn't vote for me. And immediately after I took over government, I called some members of my government, I said, look, the Yorubas didn't vote for us. Let us see what we can do. I didn't say that because they didn't vote for me. The type of statement that President Buhari made when after the 19, uh, 20, 2015 election, and he said only those who voted for him will enjoy patronage. Now, that immediately put the back of some people up. Now, and then there are at least two zones who did not vote for him. South, South did not vote for him. South East did not vote for him. And anything he does, they see it, oh, he has said those who did not vote for him will not enjoy patronage. So you divide them. You, it, you made it they and we uh, straight away. I wouldn't do that. That is specific. Then, <clears throat> when you have a situation where your own tribe is being accused of something, now you must be able to look into it and make it transparently clear that that accusation is unfounded, or if it's founded, you deal with it. The, there have been, well, Hartsman, uh, 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 farmers. Now, husbands are mainly Fulanese. Nothing has been done. Rather than doing something about it, what we are having is, okay, we will create colonies. Katu colony. Where will you create colony in Nigeria? Is it in my own part of the country that you will now make a colony? Who will give you land to create colony within its own uh, state? So these are specific. You are asking for specific. I can go on and on. But there are many things that should not have been in Absolutely. So um, that was the former president, Olusha Sanjo, you know, at a conference, Wilson Center, you know, talking. All right. So please let us hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join this conversation. Tweet at us at Waste Your Africa One with the hashtag Waste Show. Or send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 81 all right, so let me come to Uti first. You know, I'll come to EC then. Uti, um, yeah. the question I asked earlier on before we watched the video is, how did we get to this point where it seems like we're so, we're not, we're not tolerating another no, no, tribe, no, no. right? I mean, when I was growing up, when I see anybody, I see a Nigerian, right? Mm. I don't see an Igbo man or a Yoruba man. In fact, I posted a video of me dancing, uh, what's it called? Um, Igbo, Igbo um, traditional dance. I mean, growing up, I was the forefront of 
especially cultural dances, Yoruba and Igbo, they always call me as a leader because it was almost like the thing was in my blood. Because there was nothing that was making anyone feel like, oh, I'm from Edo State or I'm from this. I was just a Nigerian. So where did we get to that? How did we get to this point where it seems like all the time, every conversation comes up and it is across tribal lines? So, I mean, when I think about this, I totally agree with you that growing up, it was a completely different experience. So um, we didn't have the religious bias we have today. We didn't have the, the tribal bias was there, but it wasn't as prolific as it is today. Mm -hmm. And when I find situations like this, my mind always uh, you know, if you're if you're solution driven, you you always want to understand the root cause of something. Yeah. And I start to think to myself, what is the foundation? What is the because I mean, in other countries, well, in some countries, let me take African countries. In other non-African countries, right? Tribalism isn't really a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you look at in America, in America, when they talk about President Trump, I'm not sure I know what state he's from. I'm sure if I think about it, I will remember. But that's not what I remember about him. I don't remember what state Barack Obama is from. I don't remember what state Bill Clinton is from. So when I think about coming back to Nigeria and I say, you know, in Nigeria, in Africa, why is this problem, you know, so, so, so prevalent? And I find that when I go back to the genesis of this, the first thing for me is the foundation itself of Nigeria. Mm. I'm, I'm sorry to say I'm part of those people that think that that whole amalgamation process may not have been the right Best. thing, right? In terms of merging the Northern and, and Southern protectorates together. I think that that really for me is what I would class as the foundation because when you take people who are, you know, when you look at Nigerians, I always say that we're stronger in our diversity. Mm -hmm. But when you actually look at our cultures, we are so different. Chalk, cheese, water, oil, we are so different. And the differences, it's like culture, right? It's all pervasive. Mm. It's in mindset. Mm -hmm. It's in everything, how we speak, how we think, how we look. It's so different. Now, I mean, this diversity is beautiful. When we can come together and accept our differences as our strengths, mm -hmm. rather than looking at them as our weaknesses, then as you come through our history, I won't go through you know, a history lesson, I, I, I will park at Biafra, at the wall. That has left a major, major, major sour sore. Let me not even call it a sour taste. It's a open wound, mm. gaping, mm. that we haven't addressed in this country. We all, I wasn't alive in that time. I only know as much of it as I have read, I have researched. But if you meet somebody from the southeast and have a conversation you will know that it is raw it's not it's yeah. not like history it's real mm -hmm. so all these things for me you know nigerians we think tribe first yeah. you know how they say you think in your language mm -hmm. so people who speak multiple languages they think in one language and they translate and then they speak mm -hmm. that's how nigerians are we think in tribes so you get that somebody is saying something before anything, once you mention a tribe, mm, people I that went to the conversation before activate. <laughs> and just the way, right, and, and just for me to round this up, just the way Trump brought out some of the negative factors mm -hmm. of his country, I believe our current leadership has also widened the divide. Absolutely. Because when, you, when it appears that cows, when we are not in India, Cows have more value than human life. Questions will be raised. Eyebrows will be, sorry, questions will be asked. Eyebrows that's will be raised. raised. Yeah. And that's where we find ourselves today. And you know, the worst part of it is now that we have social media, people's really, really strong, toxic views, they fly around the world so fast. Mm -hmm. So you that hadn't even stopped to think about it, there you are going about on the streets of social media, generally, and then you bump into a fellow tribesman's comments and then you you sit and you ruminate on it and all of a sudden you have a problem that you didn't know you had mm. and then you put it on your head because that's what tribalism is right 
I don't want to feel like I'm being marginalized. So when I feel like my brother and my tribe is being marginalized, we are all being marginalized. Mm. And then the fight takes on a new shape. So Absolutely. that's what we're seeing. So, Absolutely. so many things are happening. And it, it, it just doesn't make sense to everybody. At some point, even you, you can't sit on the fence any longer. Mm -hmm. Even the smaller tribes, we can't sit on the fence any longer. People are taking sides. And in my mind, I just think, exactly. this is it. You know, Nigeria is always on one powder keg or the other. Mm. I always ask myself, where is this one going? Because now, all these things that we felt were northern issues. Hmm. Last week, we saw all sorts playing out in Ibadan. Ibadan is down the road, Absolutely. by the way, Lagosians. Absolutely. 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 You know, it is very worrying. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me come to you, EC, because, um, I mean, Uti has raised a very pertinent point about our leadership structure, because it seemed like, you know, the quietness of our president on some of these issues, you know, has given a lot of um, wings for these people to continue to perpetuate, you know, some of the things that they've been doing. So I get it that these people might not be his people, but I think the the, the effrontery, right? The, I mean... Come on, we used to drive on Lagos, I'm sorry, on um, Benin, um, Kajana Road, Road without go through Abuja fear. without fear. Like, it's so scary now what is happening. And you now hear all the time that these are headsmen, these are, you know, so how, I don't even know how. So in your opinion, what, what do you think you want to make sense of all of this that is happening? Why did we get to where we are today? That, um... I, I was listening to a politician mm. talk last week, and he said that there are differences between the herdsmen and the bandits. Mm. That the herdsmen, when they go into a, an environment, they try to commune with the leaders, they try to commune with the people in that environment and interact with them and make them understand that, oh, please give us room to actually um, graze our cow or our cattle. cattle. But bandits just come in take over the place and from what we're even hearing currently that the people that are actually causing so much mayhem in Nigeria they don't even speak the language mm. of Nigerians so there there is so much happening that we do not even know where we are going to take it from but one thing I can hold on to is this that a situation whereby in the north the um, education structure is not stable it's not concrete where we have a situation whereby a few limited people are allowed have, to, go, to, to go to school. Mm -hmm. So we have a different mindset of individuals or children that are growing in the north. And so whenever there is an elite that comes up and who is educated, who is well-traveled, and comes in and says, oh, this is where I want you to go, this is what I want you to do, they believe in that person because they have one voice. Their religion holds them to um, speak in one voice and they believe that, yes, this is what you want us to do. So you're going to still pin so it down to... to mindset, education, and the fact that the elite in the North mm. are taking advantage of the poor mm. in the North and making them come out of the, um, what was the right word for this, making them come out as being bandits mm -hmm. at the end of the day. So they say that everything rises and falls on leadership, right? Totally. Um, I remember growing up, I mean, I've been through several religious crises in Kaduna State. Um, I remember the very first one, was it Zango Kataf, if I can remember that one, mm. where, you know, when you're going on the road, when you meet these people with their arms and their cutlasses and all of that, they ask you, where are you from? You know, I remember that the one scenario, we were all in the car, my father, my mother, some of the children, you know, we were packed like sardines in the car. And when they, when they stopped us, you know, my, my mom, they were asking, where are you, are you in, in America, you know? Mm -hmm. And we now said, no, we're not, you know, and they let us go. But they mm -hmm. killed so many, many people evils. then. But you see, I, I, I said this on Tuesday, I'll just say it again. Mm -hmm. Why I say that everything rises and falls on leadership is some of these things, and this was the hope that we had, um, um, voting for President Buhari at 20, oh, um, um, uh, 2015, 2015 election, because we thought that, you know, because President, former President Obasanjo had the military background. background. So, I went through different crises, and I know how it was almost like a swift, they deploy soldiers immediately you know, to, to calm the situation and to, to, to you know, put, restore peace and order back in the situation. In the but with, with, with um, President Buhari, I, I mean, I've never heard where repeatedly 
People are being displaced from their homes, their villages. I mean, we heard a very, very, very sad and pathetic story in December where some people had to go and pay these bandits money that allow us to please celebrate Christmas, Christmas in our villages. Peace. Like, I mean, where did, how did we get to this point? And our leaders don't seem to, you know, don't seem are to... perturbed. They don't even seem to bother. And now I think also, so when I say leadership, I'm also going to tie it to politics, mm -hmm. right? So have we gotten to that point where it seems like we've lost everything? We're just focused on um, being in a position of power and we'll do anything. Because now, if, you, if it comes to politics, mm -hmm. they bring the religious card. They bring the tribal card all the time. And we keep falling for it. So how do we even rise above this thing? Because if you are abroad, Uti, mm -hmm. and you've lived abroad, if you are abroad, I mean, you don't know any uh, Niger Yoruba or Igbo. Mm. You are all Nigerians when you are abroad. It's all about Once you see a fellow Nigerian, they speak, you are all one. Mm -hmm. But when you are in Nigeria, it's a different uh, kettle Ball of fish. Game. Totally. Uti, let me hear your thoughts. So, I find that... Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can yes. hear you. Now. Yeah, so again, you know, when we talk about leadership, and we talk about this bias, I find that when you, um, how will I put it? When you, let me leave the leadership. When you look at the populace, because again, I always say a government is an aberration of the people. You don't, you don't, you know, our leaders didn't fall from the sky. Mm -hmm. They are Nigerians. They were raised in Nigeria, most of them. Um, so when we look at the people, Let's look at the expectation that people have of leaders. When you have a governor in a state, the minute a governor is appointed, what, what are people focused on? The people in his area, in his local government or his locality, whatever you want to call it, they're celebrating. I remember in Lagos State, the former um, governor, um, Governor Ambadi, Complete, it seemed like Ekwe changed. Ah, Uti, I passed through Ekwe. <laughs> Ekwe became London. <laughs> Do you get what I mean? Land in Ekwe all of a sudden was gold. Hmm. And there was this expectation hmm. that he's from here. So in fact, in Nigeria now, when a governor does nothing for his area, they swear, they abuse him. He's useless. Hmm. But why should that be the expectation? Is the governor not for all of us? Hmm. Is the president not for all of us? So when we come back to what President Obasanjo was saying in that video, that you as leadership is playing on these sentiments. Mm -hmm. So you have said, um, based on what he said in the video, that I will patronize all the people who, the areas that voted for us, will- We'll treat them right. So we'll get patronage. Mm. You are already drawing lines. So the bias is not fueled. You know, the leadership does what it's going to do. We were having a conversation a few days ago when the news broke about the changing of service chiefs. Yeah. And I asked a simple question. What is it? We're all rejoicing now. You know, when you jump out of frying pan, or how, which way is it now? When into you jump fire. out of the frying pan into the fire, you may be unaware, you know, like a frog in hot water doesn't know until it's too late. So you, you, change the service chiefs because everybody says change the service chiefs, change the service chiefs. Why? Because they're ineffective. And I ask, please, by what measure hmm. are they being assessed mm -hmm. if you say they're ineffective? Mm -hmm. You and I say they're supposed to quell whatever they are, whatever is happening, Boko Haram, banditry, herdsmen, whichever, you know, name they want to call it. Nomenclature you want to call it. But the reality is, I keep asking, please, in closed doors, what mission were they given? What job description? Is it in line with the expectations of the populace? Mm -hmm. or not? So I look at this and we say, our leadership just play on the people. Mm. Absolutely. Okay, so we are going to take a very short break. When we return, Isia will hear your comments, then we'll take okay. the comments of our viewers and also open the phone line. Stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> 